it's not optional to understand this. It's absolutely crucial to understand this. With this un, in unholy marriage of the postmodern nihilism with, with this Marxist utopian notion. They're so reprehensible and so incoherent and so cult-like. You don't know how deep this war goes in some sense. They're not interested in, in, in at all in education. They're interested in the indoctrination of people as young as, young as they can get their hands on. In the postmodern neo-Marxist universe, there's nothing but power. It's an assault on is everything that's been established since the Enlightenment. Rationality, empiricism, science, everything. It's not only that it's up for grabs. That's not the thing. It's to be destroyed. That's the goal. To be destroyed. Postmodern neo-Marxism. It's one of the terms that Jordan Peterson is most famous for. It galvanizes the ire of his fan base and sends the anti-Peterson crowd into a veritable apoplexy. It is impossible not to be stirred by the vehement passion of Peterson when he's talking about the postmodern neo-Marxists. Now, whether the feeling stirred is total rage at Peterson or at the so-called social justice warriors really depends, of course, on your own political leanings. For those of us who are partial to a young Ian Brew, this should have immediately stirred our suspicions. Because now, looking back at it, it is painfully obvious that what we're seeing is a dance of the archetypal shadow. Peterson's narrative about the postmodern neo-Marxist goes, as we will see, beyond all proper bounds and into the realm of conspiracy theory. It's not simple dismay with a cultural trend. It is a belief that this is a nefarious plot to overtake and overthrow our society. When you put it like that, it's not too hard to see that what we're talking about here is Jordan Peterson's shadow. It's written everywhere in this discourse. It makes a straw man out of his opponents and makes the French continental philosophers into scapegoats for the decline of the West. And what's so perfect about it is that Peterson's discourse constellates the shadow of the so-called social justice warriors. They see an old privileged white man. This is what I'm saying to you. Why the rage, bruh? You, you, you're doing well, but you're a mean, mad white man. Dismissing their oppression and calling them ungrateful for not loving the world that they live in. The first thing that you might want to note about postmodernism is that it doesn't have a shred of gratitude. And there's something pathologically wrong with a person who does have, doesn't have any gratitude, especially when they live in what so far is the best of all possible worlds. And so if you're not grateful, you're driven by resentment. And resentment is the, about the worst emotion that you can possibly experience. Carl Jung would have had an absolute field day for an age ruled by controversy-loving algorithms. Peterson's discourse was like crack cocaine. And I think it's about time we pierced that veil. In this episode, we're going to explore how postmodern neo-Marxism is a manifestation of Jordan Peterson's Jungian shadow, and more specifically, how Michel Foucault represents his bête noire. He says in his terrible Alberta French. To do this, we're first going to briefly reconstruct Peterson's argument, which comprises three main pieces. There's the relativism of postmodernism, the neo-Marxist sleight of hand, and the attack on enlightenment values. Once we've done that, we will look at how Peterson's argument is a manifestation of his shadow in the form of an elaborate conspiracy theory that invokes the American psyche's worst nightmares, communism, and an attack on the enlightenment values of its founding fathers. What, is this a communist country or something? I thought this is America! We are also going to look at why Peterson's shadow has been so explosive. Firstly, because it is a collective shadow of one group in society, and secondly, because it powerfully constellates the complementary shadow of the so-called social justice warriors. In short, it is a cocktail of shadow psychology jacked up on algorithm juice and fueled by mob mentality. The first time I came across Jordan Peterson was on Joe Rogan's podcast uh, a few months after his first appearance. And I immediately was in love with his ideas. His uh, combination of Jung and of Nietzsche is just like intellectual catnip for me. There's actually only one aspect of Peterson's thought that I'm not that keen on, and yet it happens to be the reason why I and so many others have discovered it. And while I'm sympathetic to many of his points in the context of the culture wars, his main argument is built on what can only be described as a conspiracy theory. As fans of JP, we have all heard the postmodern neo-Marxist spiel a hundred times, but I'm going to try here to reconstruct the overall argument so that we all know what we're talking about. For Peterson, there are three critical aspects to the postmodern neo-Marxist framework. The first part then is the postmodernist element, 
the second half of the video, we'll touch a bit on the slipperiness of this term postmodernist, but for now, we'll take it for granted and focus on Peterson's characterization of this movement, which, for all intents and purposes, is made up of Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault. Other than one passing reference to Lyotard, another to Sartre, and a few to Lacan, Peterson never really discusses any other philosophers of this era in any depth. His targets are Derrida and Foucault. Peterson identifies one doctrine above all with this tradition, and that is relativism. JP usually frames this in terms of Derrida's there is nothing outside the text. Basically, the idea is that when you're reading any text, there are an infinite number of interpretations that can be brought to bear on it. But this is just the beginning, because the world is far more complex than any text, and so any interpretation we make of the world is only going to be one interpretation among many. There is no canonical interpretation, no final and ultimate truth. This relativism is the first aspect of Peterson's postmodern neo-Marxist equation. The second element is the neo-Marxist piece. Peterson argues that in the 1960s and 70s, the postmodern philosophers pulled off what he repeatedly calls a sleight of hand. A sleight of hand. Sleights of hand. Sleight of hand. Sleight of hand. A sleight of hand. This sleight of hand. Sleight of hand. Sleight of hand. Sleight of hand. The argument goes something like this. So he says the French philosophy in the mid 20th century is riddled with Marxism. But in the 1960s and 70s, as the horrors of the gulags and of Mao's cultural revolution begin to emerge, especially with the publishing of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's The Gulag Archipelago, communism becomes an untenable position. And so now that communism is untenable, the French philosophers who are so fond of Karl Marx are left with a major problem. What do they do about Marxism? And so they find a solution. They perform a sleight of hand that allows them not only to keep their Marxist philosophy, but in doing so, devise an even more nefarious plan where they can, of course, try to take over the world. So the way the philosophers did it was they swapped out Marxism's narrative of history being a never ending class struggle between the rich and the poor, and they replaced that with a slightly more abstracted version. They transformed the Marxist dialogue of, of rich versus poor into oppressed versus oppressor. And with that done, French philosophy ostensibly left behind Marxism and instead fomented a different type of revolution. Classic Marxism had been reborn as identity politics, but that's not all. This is where the argument, if it hadn't already, enters the unambiguous waters of conspiracy theory. Peterson seems to argue that these postmodern neo-Marxists were not merely teaching their beliefs, but that there was some sort of method to it all. Instead of the Marxists taking over the world through a violent revolution, the neo-Marxists or cultural Marxists take over society by capturing the educational system. They're not interested in, in, in at all in education. They're interested in the indoctrination of people as young as they can uh, as young as they can get their hands on, so to speak. This isn't an accident, but a plot. They know exactly what they're doing, and they know exactly why they're doing it. And that brings us onto the third element of Peterson's argument, the target of the postmodern neo-Marxists. And true to form, these pesky postmodern neo-Marxists target the same thing all shadow villains go after, everything we hold dear. And the second thing it's an assault on is everything that's been established since the Enlightenment. Rationality, empiricism, science, everything. Clarity of mind, dialogue, um, the idea of the individual, all of that is... is not only, you see, it's not only that it's up for grabs. That's not the thing. It's to be destroyed. That's the goal, to be destroyed. Just like the communists wanted, you know, wanted the revolution to destroy the, the capitalist system. It's the same thing. We have our bet noir and say with the old Pharisee, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. We don't want to know that we are the other men. There's a lot of holes in this argument of Peterson about postmodern neo-Marxism and I suppose the first thing we should point out is that most of this argument was taken from a book by a guy called Stephen Hicks. I want to recommend a book first to everyone here. It's called Explaining Postmodernism and it's by a gentleman named Stephen Hicks. And for a breakdown of the many, many scholarly errors in Hicks's book, I'd highly recommend Jonas Seika's video dissection, which I'll link in the cards and down below in the description. 
we should also talk about the extremely controversial term postmodernism. It's worth remembering that postmodern isn't a term that these philosophers applied to themselves. In fact, Foucault publicly and passionately excluded himself from the category. And so it's a slippery term that we must be careful with. These philosophers don't fall into such a natural grouping together that we could talk about their views as being homogenous. When Peterson talks about the focus of postmodernism being a scepticism of grand narratives, you have to remember that this was Leo Tard's characterization of postmodernity and not a manifesto written by a group of philosophers who call themselves postmodernists. Thirdly, the collapse of Marxism is not nearly as dramatic as Peterson makes it out to be. It was very far from becoming a taboo position in the 60s and 70s. Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, which Peterson identifies as the catalyst for the downfall of communism, was published in 1974. In the next election, in 1978, the French Communist Party received its highest number of votes ever. In total, they got 5.8 million votes, up from 5 million in 1973. That's more than 20% of the French public voting for the Communist Party. And while communism star was waning, the communist candidate for the 1981 French presidency still received 4.4 million votes. That's very far from being an untenable position. We also have to talk about Peterson's characterization of Derrida and Foucault as being fervent Marxists. Anyone who's studied either thinker in any depth knows this to be not just patently false, but bizarre. Derrida is perhaps the least political of all the so-called postmodernist philosophers. He finally broke his silence with 1993's Spectres of Marx, but this is much more a dismissal of Marxism and a transcendence of it than anything else. Foucault, on the other hand, was the French philosopher most known for savaging Marx and Marxists. He became a member of the Communist Party for a year when he first entered university, but unlike his classmates, he left disgusted with Marxism. This was in the 1940s, long before anything about the gulags or about Mao. In 1975, when Foucault was protesting the impending execution of 11 Spaniards without trial by the fascist regime of General Franco, a young militant asked Foucault if he would give a talk to his group about Marx. Foucault snapped at him. Don't talk to me about Marx anymore. I never want to hear anything about that man again. Ask someone whose job it is. Someone paid to do it. Ask the Marxist functionaries. I've had enough of Marx. These are hardly the words you'd expect from the man Peterson credits with figuring out how to resurrect Marxism under a new guise. This early flirtation between Foucault and Marxism isn't unlike Peterson's own relationship with socialism. In the preface to his epic neo-Jungian work Maps of Meaning, he talks about his membership of a socialist party where he first went to university. In the meantime, however, my nascent concern with questions of moral justice found immediate resolution. I started working as a volunteer for a mildly socialist political party and adopted the party line. Economic injustice was at the root of all evil as far as I was concerned. Such injustice could be rectified as a consequence of the rearrangement of social organisations. I could play a part in that admirable revolution carrying out my ideological beliefs. Doubt vanished. My role was clear. Looking back, I'm amazed at how stereotypical my actions, reactions, really were. I could not rationally accept the premises of religion as I understood them. I turned, in consequence, to dreams of political utopia and personal power. The same ideological trap caught millions of others in recent centuries. The Jungian shadow is the parts of ourselves that we hide in darkness, the parts that we repress. Jungian analyst Robert Johnson calls it the long bag we drag behind us. The shadow is always with us. If we're not aware enough of it, it bleeds out. Jung calls it the archetype of projection, and this is the way in which we come to know the shadow. We know it by how we react to others and to the world around us. A certain imbalance between the external stimulus and our reaction suggests the workings of the shadow archetype. With that in mind, let's talk about Michel Foucault and let's listen to the way that Peterson characterizes the French philosopher. Foucault in particular, who never fit in anywhere and who was an outcast in many ways and a bitter one and a suicidal one his entire life, did everything he possibly could with his staggering IQ 
to figure out every treacherous way possible to undermine the structure that wouldn't accept him in all his peculiarity and it's no wonder because there would be no way of making a structure that could possibly function if it was composed of people who were as peculiar, bitter and resentful as Michel Foucault so you couldn't imagine a functioning society that would be composed of individuals with his particular makeup. As a big Jordan Peterson fan, <laughs> this profile is actually a little haunting because it sounds uncomfortably close to the way Peterson is portrayed by the people who despise him. The mean mad white comment was not predicated upon my historical excavation of your past. It's based upon the evident vitriol with which you speak and the denial of a sense of equanimity among combatants in an argument. So I'm saying again, you're a mean mad white man and the viciousness is evident. The unempathetic comments about the outcasts with the poor mental health brings to mind the reactions on Twitter to Peterson's journey through his hell of getting over benzos. The comments about IQ and about the misfit whose voice was charged with bitterness and resentment. This sounds like a portrayal of Peterson himself by his opponents. And that is no coincidence. In his work Psychology and Religion, Carl Jung writes the following about the projection of the shadow. Modern science has subtilized its projections to an almost unrecognizable degree, but our ordinary life still swarms with them. You can find them spread out in the newspapers, in books, rumours and ordinary social gossip. All gaps in our actual knowledge are still filled out with projections. We are still so sure we know what other people think or what their true character is. We are convinced certain people have all the bad qualities we do not know in ourselves or that they practice all those vices which could, of course, never be known. We must still be exceedingly careful not to project our own shadows too shamelessly. We are still swamped with projected illusions. Seen through a Jungian lens then, Peterson's rebellion against Derrida and Foucault is him shadow boxing with his own repressed sight. Peterson abandoned the path of social change in favour of personal transformation and personal responsibility. He abandoned the possibility of transformation in one quadrant and he focused his belief on another. The light of this focus on personal transformation and the depth of his knowledge casts a dark shadow, however, and we see this manifesting in his blind disdain for the postmodernists. Now, you might be tempted to say that this idea of the shadow, it's, it's fascinating, it's really interesting, but also, isn't Peterson right? Aren't the postmodernists obsessed with power? Aren't they, aren't they all Marxists? And while Foucault does talk a lot about power, his conception of power isn't like Peterson's caricature of it, as this Hobbesian boogeyman of groups fighting tooth and nail to the death. Foucault's conception of power is very far from the Hobbesian one. And you would actually expect Peterson to have recognised Foucault's use because it comes from the two men's shared favourite philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche was a much more substantial influence on Foucault than Marx ever was. Foucault's conception of power is derived from Nietzsche's will to power. Power in this sense isn't a Hobbesian battleground, but a neutral force. Power is the ocean that we swim in. Foucault didn't want to abolish power any more than he wanted to abolish oxygen. Kevin Boucault Victoire and Daniel Zamora made some very interesting observations about this in their interview for Jacobin magazine on Foucault's experimentation with neoliberalism. Foucault did not believe in revolution but rather in day-to-day -day micro resistances and in the need to invent one's life. He thought one's relation to oneself was the first and ultimate point of resistance to political power. It was, I think, only in his last decade, through his interest in techniques of the self, that he started to grant the subject more autonomy. Thus, power gradually started to take shape as a blend of the techniques of constraint and the techniques of the self, in which the subject constitutes itself. Power and resistance are now two sides of the same coin. The relation to the self thus becomes a potential space of freedom and autonomy that individuals can mobilise in opposition to power. Since power is omnipresent, Foucault's thought didn't aspire to liberate the individual, but rather to increase his autonomy. Using techniques of the self to garner more autonomy for the individual and to rebel against tyrannical political institutions? Who does that remind you of? This isn't exactly the Hobbesian battleground that Peterson was so afraid of. It's not his nightmare of the exercise of arbitrary power. This is his own exact form of rebellion, 
This is another Nietzschean lover talking about using power in a Nietzschean sense to attain the autonomy of the individual against a structure of power. In one of the greatest ironies in the history of ideas, Peterson's main targets actually have the potential to be his greatest allies, if only he could pierce through the fog of his shadow for long enough to do so. Foucault was against the tyrannical uses of power, and concerned himself greatly with the struggle against it. This sounds like a playbook Peterson could have learned a lot from. Instead, we get an intense shadow projection. In a rather ironic twist, Peterson ends up making satanically possessed demons out of the two philosophers in the French tradition who are most heavily influenced by his philosopher of choice, Friedrich Nietzsche. His shadow doesn't just end with a demonization of Foucault and Derrida's personality, however, but extends much deeper. In the psychological field that studies conspiracy theories, a conspiracy theory is defined as explanations for important events that involve secret plots by powerful and malevolent groups. In the movements of these postmodern neo-Marxist philosophers, Peterson sees a conspiracy to destroy the West. He argues that the postmodernists managed to transform Marxism, and with this transformed Marxism, these neo-Marxists plan to succeed where other revolutions had failed. They are going to take over and destroy Western culture from the inside. I mean, these, these, this, this intellectual war that's going on in the universities is way deeper than a political war. It's, it's, it's and way, more, way more serious than a political war. Of course, this picture is just a little bit too perfect, and it's something that should have raised our suspicions. When the Nazis came to power, the people of Europe were already used to seeing the Jewish people as the enemy. In the North American psyche, we have a similar relationship with communism. If you want to get Americans riled up about something, there's no better scapegoat than the good old commies. And it's not simply a question of communism. The target of postmodern neo-Marxism is nothing less than our Western values as a whole. That's the goal to be destroyed, just like the communists wanted, you know, wanted the revolution to destroy the, the capitalist system. It's the same thing. So what we have here is a malevolent plot to deconstruct our Western society. Everything we hold dear is under threat, and by who? None other than America's Cold War enemies, the communists. This is a conspiracy theory. And more than that, it is a direct gaze into the shadow of Jordan Peterson and the shadow of our modern Western culture. We are possessed. Everyone has some jacked up opinion on the culture wars. People are filled with fury. The fury is completely unbalanced. One might argue that this is down to the outrage fetishism of the algorithms, but I would argue that these algorithms are in fact virtual bellows amplifying our culture's archetypal shadows. Our culture has become an archetypal battleground, and obviously this is very far from being a one-sided affair. Peterson is reacting to a shadow on the other side, and they are reacting to his. There's something happening in the world, but we have to be very, very careful here about getting involved in the realm of the gods. We are being possessed and thinking of ourselves as soldier in some battleground of the divinities. This is what runs so counter to Peterson's true message, and a message I strongly believe in. Make your bed, brush your teeth, as Voltaire would put it, cultivate your own garden. You are human, you are one person surrounded by other people. Forget about this war between Ares and Artemis and focus on what it is to be human. Love your neighbour, love yourself. That at least is a whole lot simpler to do. This stuff is just an intoxicant. It's like an 80% absinthe that everyone in the culture is drinking every single day. If you find yourself getting really worked up and angry and thinking that other people are possessed by the devil, that you are a white knight going to save the world, you have gone beyond your proper bounds. Jordan's haters think that he is a lost cause, but this is very far from being the case. In his interview with John Verveke, we see Peterson genuinely open to being corrected. He respects Verveke and knows that he operates in good faith and that his knowledge is superior in this domain. And so Peterson genuinely asks Verveke, showing that he's not so certain and that he is willing to learn. Am I misreading early Derrida and Foucault by attributing to them the claim that 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 it is power that they identify as the central spirit and am I wrong in saying that that's just a modified Marxist claim? While we might desire a bit more caution in the public sphere and suggest that perhaps we could do more pause before rushing into an archetypal war with a lack of knowledge. 
Nevertheless, I think Peterson is open to learning, and he is a man who knows enough about the shadow that he could even take this kind of criticism on board. My only fear is that as far as JP is concerned, it's already too late. I'll leave you with a quote of Carl Jung's from his book Psychology and Religion. The change of character brought about by the uprush of collective forces is amazing. A gentle and reasonable being can be transformed into a maniac or a savage beast. One is always inclined to lay the blame on external circumstances, but nothing could explode in us if it had not been there. As a matter of fact, we are constantly living on the edge of a volcano, and there is, so far as we know, no way of protecting ourselves from a possible outburst that will destroy everybody within reach. It is certainly a good thing to preach reason and common sense, but what if you have a lunatic asylum for an audience, or a crowd in collective frenzy? There is not much difference between them, because the madman and the mob are moved by impersonal, overwhelming forces. That's everything for this episode of The Living Philosophy. If you really enjoyed it, please give the video a thumbs up down below. And if you really enjoy the, this video and the channel in general, then why not head over to Patreon where you can get access to early scripts, sometimes early videos and lots of other cool things like get your name in the credits and just generally support the channel. And as ever, if you have any thoughts, insights or feedback, I'd love to hear from you down in the comments. Otherwise, I shall see you next time. Thank you for watching.